again everybody welcome back to digital housing 2020 dh 2020 uh, we are moving into our keynote segment uh, and i'm very excited to have with me uh, jeffrey hall jeffrey hall is the ceo of uh, jamaica producers group he's also the chairman of scotia group scotia investment kingston wharf lumber depot a director of blue power vice president of psoj and i think i'll I leave the rest. The long tail. <laughs> but um, it's to say Jeffrey is a stalwart of the Jamaican business environment um, would not uh, be, be overstating it in any way. Um, thank you very much for joining us for Digital Housing. And I'm looking forward to this conversation on corporate leadership. Thank you, Javet. <laughs> Thanks to Point Global for inviting me. Wonderful. Uh, I, I want to start off with what is, is on a lot of persons' mind regarding the pandemic. Um, corona pandemic uh, has tested character, it has tested the economy, it has tested business resilience. Um, given um, COVID, given the pandemic, given what is happening globally now, what is your outlook for the Jamaican and the Caribbean economy? Well, let's try to measure where we are on a couple of quick dimensions. One dimension would be obviously just the, the level of health impact. So if we, if we look at, so the business that I uh, run on a day-to-day -day basis, I would describe as a multinational. So we have operations in Jamaica, UK, Netherlands, Domrep, Cayman, US, etc. From a, a narrow healthcare perspective, Jamaica is, despite the current uh, peak, is actually relatively well off. Right. So if you look at kind of deaths per million, which is a morbid number, but right. it's relevant, Jamaica would be now at about 30, whereas the UK and the US are north of 600. Netherlands is 370, Domrep is about 180. And so from a healthcare perspective, we're not yet defeated. Now the issue with the economy, so the outlook for our economy is a minus eight to 10% for the full fiscal year. And the initial, the initial assessment by the IMF was between five and six and it's gotten worse. Just for everybody to understand, Jamaica has, has not had that level of adverse economic impact in a single year for 50 years. So right. 2008, for example, the big recession would have been on the order of 4% sure. or less, actually. 1979 was on the order of 5 a little over 5%. 1976 was another bad one. But we haven't seen anything like this. So it's going to be big, and it's going to be compounded by the share of our GDP that's in tourism. Okay. Um, so our, our direct impact from tourism is about 10.5% of GDP, but the, the estimates, and there's a little debate going on, but the estimates of the indirect share of GDP from tourism are about 30%. But connected to just the sheer GDP impact or the, the impact on what we produce and what employs us is likely to be a foreign exchange impact, which right. is quite significant. Yeah. And we can talk about that, but in, in round numbers, the gap is on the order of 800 million US that we have to find or reprice. Okay. So those uh, are some big numbers we can talk about it in more detail. Uh, you, you, you mentioned the, the exchange rate and for, for many ordinary Jamaicans, that's the environment of health for the Jamaican economy. Are we too fixated on the exchange rate? Is that a, a good measure of health? I hear BOJ saying inflation is what is important. Uh, for, for, for the ordinary Jamaican um, that is seeing the dollar, um, weaken against its hard currency trading partners. Are we too fixating, fi fixated on the Jamaican exchange rates versus other currencies? So it's right for us to say that we have a high import component to the things that we eat and the things that we wear and, and, you know, and the places in which we live. Yeah. So we're importing steel and we're importing clothing and so on. So from that perspective, exchange rate matters and a depreciation of the exchange rate is seen uh, in, in inflation in some instances. But it's, A, it's not the only thing that matters, and B, it's not a very useful policy tool, i.e. A, a revaluation of the exchange rate or a holding of the exchange rate at a level that's not market determined 
doesn't actually give us any more shoes right. or, or steel. <laughs> the, the, so the pathway to getting more steel and more shoes and, and more technology is likely to revolve not around us fixing the exchange rate. We're kind right. of grabbing onto the wrong bus. Right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to revolve around us figuring out how we produce and how we compete. And our ability to compete is, is actually enhanced by depreciating exchange rates. So for the, for the lifetime of, of most adults, like myself, um, the, the, there's been a, the inflation rate in, in Jamaica has been um, higher than the depreciation of the exchange rate year on year. And so we actually weren't getting more competitive right. when we were holding exchange. We were becoming less competitive. Right. In recent times, there's been instances in which we become more competitive, which for business people presents an opportunity. Right. See, the, wait, let's shift to the productive sector because the, the, the argument is well, let's stop focusing on the exchange rate. Let's get better at business, get better at producing. Where are the areas of opportunities that you are seeing in not only the Jamaican economy, uh, but given the, the, the vantage point from which you operate, what, where are the areas of opportunities that you are seeing globally? Um, and if you could go specific to the Caribbean region. Okay, so let, let's talk about this because this is a little, it's a bit complicated, but also fairly interesting. So there's a couple of ways to, to look at the question. One way is, is in light of COVID. Right. So let's have a quick discussion about that, and then let's talk about kind of a more general view. So in terms of COVID, there are kind of two categories of things that I would be interested in. The first category would be things that have been disrupted by COVID. So my investment thesis and what I do for a living is, is could loosely be called value investing. Right. So we look for companies that are undervalued and buy them and then try to operate them efficiently. And that's been very successful for us. And so we, we expect there will be businesses that have been disrupted by COVID that will become available in the obvious places, travel, um, you know, tourism, various, um, some parts of the logistics trade, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then there will be businesses that, for which transformation has been accelerated by COVID. Right. So COVID presents opportunities. Right. Digital is a huge part of that. Um, I would say... If I were interested in that space, one of the things about the Caribbean and Jamaica in particular is that we pay a lot of attention to the, the visible sectors like finance. You know, it's on the, you see the billboards, it's on the TV and so on. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole raft of space, in, of economic space mm -hmm. that's badly managed, to be frank, and presents great opportunities for entrepreneurs. And by that, so we look at the financial system, for example, look at the commercial system, mm -hmm. but, but think a bit about government. Right. E-government is a huge opportunity. The healthcare system presents massive opportunities for digital transformation. Right. The education system, even the criminal justice system, right. the system of customs and taxes. So I see big opportunities that are available not just to people doing it in Jamaica, but people doing it um, from Jamaica globally. In a macro sense, this whole move to work from home right. you know, presents a huge global opportunity. So I, I'm associated with businesses that, for example, pre-COVID would have occupied a massive you know, tower in the center of Toronto, for example. Right. And that tower is now empty. Everybody who was in that tower is working from home. Right. At some point, and that's true, that's generalizably true for a whole range of businesses. I'm not speaking about any particular one. Right. I think the world is going to very quickly going to realize that some of those things that people are doing from home can be done from home in places like Jamaica right. and can be done a lot cheaper. Right. And so the business process outsourcing business, broadly defined, not just answering the phone, I think presents a massive opportunity for Jamaica. So if you look at just the, the share of jobs that are in the U.S. that are high priced, but not just those, those that are in, in India and the Philippines that can be nearshored. You know, if we had a 1% shift in market share right. of that business to us, <laughs> right. we wouldn't have people to fill the job. So, mm. so that's a big opportunity. Yeah. But you know, in a macro sense, Javet, you know, one thing that's misunderstood about Jamaica, and it's very controversial, you know, we talk a lot about this idea of 
value-added agriculture and right. production and so right. on. <laughs> if you look, so the, the, the World Bank and IMF and a whole bunch of other statistical compilers look at the share of production of countries across the world in three broad categories, agriculture, industry, and services. And so Jamaica's share of GDP, which is everything we produce, about 7% is agriculture, about 21 would be industry, like manufacturing, and about 71 and a half would be services. Right. If you made a list of small countries across the world that had a higher share of their GDP in agriculture, so more than seven, more than eight, more than 10%. Right. And you, what you would see unambiguously, this is a little bit stark, and is that you would see, for example, Chad, Sierra Leone, Central African Republic, and a whole raft of countries that face a number of challenges. Right. If you made a list, and this is just empirical stuff, right. of countries that have a higher share of their GDP in services, mm -hmm. you would see New Zealand, Singapore, Cayman Islands, etc. Right. So we have to be careful when we're disparaging about the services sector and the tremendous potential of this digital transformation. I see big opportunities for us there. Sure. Uh, I, I, I'm happy that you, you mentioned digital transformation. Uh, I think everybody who operates in Jamaican environment uh, understands some of the challenges um, that we, we face um, on things like broadband capability, um, the reliability of our internet connections, um, our telecoms infrastructure. Uh, what role does corporate leadership and, uh, play in moving us higher up the value chain to be uh, like Singapore, where logistics is such an important part of that economy, or the United Kingdom, where financial services is such a, an important part of the economy. And one of the reasons those um, economies do well is the ICT infrastructure. What needs to happen um, in that space? Well, so, uh, you know, the, the short answer is, is the, the, the transformation that we're going to see in digital really requires disruption. Yeah. So I don't know if you, know if you want to look to the establishment corporate leaders to make this happen. Right. I, think, I think the folks who are listening to this who are not themselves establishment corporate leaders are more likely to have a massive impact because mm. the corporate leaders are too vested to see the transformation. Right. But from a policy perspective, there are a couple of things. You know, Jamaica's kind of share of private debt to GDP is lower than, let's say, Trinidad or Panama or Costa Rica. So we're probably 40, 30 something percent Whereas those countries have a high, there's higher access to debt capital right. for entrepreneurs to do things. So we need to make that happen, mm -hmm. and it will happen, and it is happening, right. including equity capital. I think that you know, when you look at the US economy, the fair competition business that disrupts um, established market leaders that have dominant positions, Jamaica is very underdeveloped from a fair competition antitrust standpoint. Right. I think that's a policy position that we could find interesting. Trade is another one. Yeah. Probably there's some opportunity to open the economy to some extent to, to competition. So those would be the policy level things. But the real issue, I think, is just giving opportunity to, to young people, to sharp people. You know, basically, it's, it's, it's us saying, you know, as a country, responding yes to people who say, coach, can I get a game, you know? Yes. <laughs> We've got to get people in the game. We've got to yes. get people who are outside, outside the, um, the establishment onto the field. Oh. Do you, if, so this, this is not, this is, yes, it's a digital question, but it steps back a little. Are, how far behind are we in, um, in, in, in your assessment of how we employ and use digital technology, just um, in, a, in a cursor. This is very uneven, right? So, so in, say, the financial sector, we're moving very rapidly. Um, I would say a majority of transactions now in, in the financial sector for the, the, the larger institutions are now digital. Um, and then, you know, and that's going to, that, the whole question of payment systems is a big part of it, because e-commerce is a big component of digital transformation. I would say the government sector is behind. But, but willing to move. I don't think we should concentrate on how far behind we are because I don't think that we are constrained other than by our own imagination. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm not pessimistic about Jamaica's ability to participate in this game. Right. Wonderful. 
so we have seen the last few quarters uh, there there's, there's been uh, uh, cooling off I would say on the the stocks stock market we have seen a slight depreciation which we appreciated um, in the Jamaican dollar after the election uh, we have seen many corporates that had big plans I think um, the, the uh, Mrs. Street um, said that they had 20 IPODs lined up prior um, to COVID. We only see one that's coming to the market currently. Uh, and a lot of leaders are shifting to um, very, they're, they're looking at one specific uh, project that they are, they are focused on, um, th that they think is important in transforming their business. Is that the appropriate response um, given where we are now and the uncertainty? or um, how do, what, what, what should leaders be thinking about when looking at their business and the plans that they have for their business in their, in their mind? So the choices are, should they be focusing on kind of a diversification play or, right. uh, or concentrating on, on a few specific things? Right. I would say that in the current environment, they should be focusing on a few specific things. You know, this idea of kind of a grupo, you know, the big grupos in the Caribbean would have existed and thrived in an era in which there were a lot more restraints on capital availability and on trade. And so they, their job was to kind of deploy management. They have a travel agency, they have a shipping line, they have a food business, they have a, uh, you know, a financial sector business. I don't think that model is necessary or desirable now. I think, I think we need to see strong expertise in, 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 in um, areas of focus. I think the market will accept that. The capital markets will appreciate that. If you look at the multiples, you'll find that that's true. I don't want to discount the success of the big Caribbean groupos because they, they have a tremendous track record. Right. But if I'm building something right now, I'd be, I'd be a category captain right. in what I'm focusing on. Right. Wonderful. Uh, so you, you, you are, you are in, you're central to the leadership of a number of businesses. Um, what is your, your overall, your current outlook for, for Kingston Wharf? My outlook for Kingston Wharf is very positive. Um, Kingston Wharf will be affected by COVID to some extent because we we handled consumer durables, you know, like right. cars, and people will defer expenditure on things like cars. Right. They'll still eat, but they'll <laughs> of course. defer their purchase on <laughs> yes. their dream car until next year. <laughs> yes. So, but we, we have the balance sheet to handle that. Sure. So that's not going to be an issue. But over the long term, mm -hmm. there's an absolutely no question that trade will continue and that uh, warehousing, logistics, will continue and Jamaica will be important in that space. Jamaica's already, you know, if you kind of ask yourself which sectors in Jamaica attract global players, which is a very good indicator of competitiveness. Right. You know, the fact that we, our partners in the business are a global uh, shipping service. Our competitors in the business are owned by the third largest shipping line in the world. And they're putting 400 million US dollars into the terminal. Right. So, so we, we're optimistic. Okay. Uh, Blue Paul? Well, people need to bathe, <laughs> and thankfully that's continuing and increasing with uh, COVID. They're washing their hands more, so our profits are up year on year. Right. And um, there's a strong appetite right now for soaps that have antibacterial properties, and we're well positioned to, to execute on that. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you know, thanks for the plug for Blue Power. <laughs> uh, and, uh, the, uh, um, Lumber Depot, we, 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 we saw the disaggregating, okay, uh, the, the separating of the, the business. Right, well, speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of focus. Right, <laughs> right. What's, what's, what's the outlook? Lumber Depot is, is performing very well. Um, I didn't realize this was a, a kind of a investment investor briefing, <laughs> but... Um, we have a lot of people who are, who are looking sure, where sure, where that, you know, money needs to go. I'm not a licensed financial <laughs> advisor, so um, you're, not, you're not authorized to take financial advice on stock picks for sure, me. Sure, sure. But what I have been intrigued by is the continuing, I would say, actually boom in construction, right. you know, and, um, and particularly the construction at a place like Lumber Depot fees, where people are doing home renovations, right. um, kind of mid-sized contractors doing things. We are finding, you can look at our numbers, and the, the um, Q1 number just came out, which is for the period ending July 31st. Sales and profits are up significantly, and um, it's continuing. Right. You know, I think as a country, we're going to have to embrace that sector a little bit more. And, um, and I, th I think that's happening to some extent. And I think um, my outlook there remains very positive. 
Uh, the, I, 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 I want to ask you about Scotia and um, your chairmanship of uh, two of the Scotia entities. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky okay. and, and ask, is, uh, we, we see what's happening with the other big financial players in Jamaica. They're making a lot of moves um, in, in the capital market. They are raised. I wasn't aware there was no other one. <laughs> They've raised, I think, um, uh, this year, in, in, in the, 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 just a few weeks ago, big capital raises. Um, uh, I think, I don't remember the exact figure, but uh, close to... I think 400 million or thereabouts. Um, they see what is happening with Guardian. Is, is Scotia um, kind of getting off the throttle in Jamaica and the Caribbean? And what is the general outlook? What, how, how does, what is, what is the play for, for the environment that Scotia operates in, in Jamaica specifically, but broadly in the Caribbean? Yeah, so Scotia has been in Jamaica for, I think, 130 years. Yeah. And Scotia remains very committed to Jamaica. Scotia's business model um, is very steady and that's proven very successful over the long term for Jamaica and so you know I, I definitely don't intend by any comment I'm about to make to give a view on any other person's strategy. Sure, sure. So Scotia um, offers you know banking services on the lending side it, it ensures that it is competitive that its turnaround time is quick that it is keeping pace with digital transformation. Um, and on the deposit side, it ensures that it is safe, reliable, um, here forever. Right. And so that, that business model gives satisfactory returns over the long term. And it's proven, and there's no intention to change it. It, it also serves um, the constituents. Mm -hmm. Uh, of Jamaica very well. Um, so, you know, so, so in short, um, you know, Scotia as a bank is rock steady and an excellent place to do business. Right. Uh, is the, the, the players like Scotia is, uh, are, are extremely important for financial inclusivity, which is a massive issue in the Jamaican economy. Um, I don't know the immediate statistics, but the, the, the number of persons in Jamaica that don't have a banking a bank account, um, who are not the unbanked, is such a big um, part of our economy. And the informality of um, some of the sectors that operate and are important to Jamaica uh, is. Are, are there any moves in in addressing uh, and being a bigger player in that? Yes, sector? yes, yes. So, so I mean, I think it's fair to say the sector as a whole is is looking at the space of of financial inclusion, and Scotia definitely is doing it. There are constraints to, yeah. to, to broad-based financial inclusion, so the, the central bank and other regulatory institutions demand a certain level of information before you can open an account. Um, wait, depending on the amount of money you're moving, there's a certain level of scrutiny to that. And I think what's happening is that they, the, the financial institutions are working with the government to make that work for all of us. And Scotia is definitely participating in that. And I think it's going to be good for not just um, individuals who might deem themselves to be underbanked, but also small businesses that have to make payments quickly sure. to people who are underbanked. Right. And employees, if you're running a construction site and you want to make payments, and, but not have to walk to the construction site with a big brown bag of cash. Right. I think um, that type of opportunity in which we use modern and digital solutions for those kinds of uh, of issues, Scotia intends to be at the forefront of that. Uh, and and uh, finally, in this overview for people are looking at, yeah, people are looking. <laughs> um, Jamaica we... Producers Group, um, we, you have your big investments in the consumer um, category. Um, there's a number of tangential businesses that are. What, what's the, what's the outlook there? Well, I don't know which, which of our businesses are tangential. <laughs> so the, the, the other subsidiaries, um, Tortuga is, is, is still a part of the group. Yeah. Um, same here as banana chips. Yeah, so we, our food businesses, our biggest food business is in the juice business, yeah. fresh juice in Europe, very avant-garde business. Um, our largest single market by revenues is the Netherlands, but also we have substantial business in Belgium, Scandinavia, etc. It's going well. Uh, it's a, it has a big food service business, and that's COVID affected in the short term. Sure. 
places like um, big, big food chains. In the Caribbean, the Tortuga business is adversely affected because it relies heavily on cruise tourism in Cayman and Barbados, to some extent in South Florida, the travel sector. So that's kind of just us being patient. The good news in that business, and the one thing I think viewers should be aware of, is that we have tripled our, our um, e-commerce business in that space, and we've significantly moved on big box retail into the US, in places like Costco and, and TJ Maxx and other, other retailers. So that's been a good story for us um, to partially offset the impact on travel retail. Right. The snack business chugs along, big innovation. You know, the Jamaican consumer is not static in the, st in the snack phase. They are forever demanding something new. Right. So we just came up with some potato chips. Mm -hmm. And and even within potato chips, you have to do something unique to get the people's attention. And we're, we're doing something called fire, which is a, a scotch bonnet kind of potato chip right. and, and worth a taste. So Wonderful. Uh, the shifting gears a little bit um, to uh, what has happened, 30, globally 32% of organizations are replacing full-time workers as a result of everything that has happened with COVID with uh, more people operating um, in a contractual or project management, a project way or through what the, the, the US terms the gig economy. Mm. Uh, is, is, is that a critical shift you know, how organizations will be managed going forward? Is that something that management teams and business leaders need to understand that shift um, with the fluidity of borders, given how that people can work from anywhere as well? Definitely. But I think the bigger thing is the opportunity it presents for us here in Jamaica. I mean, you know, my, my children, like everybody else's children, have been affected by... Um, by the um, need to do virtual schooling. Right. And so as, parents, as concerned parents, we said, okay, fine, we'll do our best with, with, with the school system as it is. But then we started to do some, some research and we realized that anybody can get a teacher to teach them anything from anywhere in the world. So he's already signed up a, a math teacher from Ukraine, right. a physics teacher from South Africa, a Spanish teacher from Guatemala, right. an English teacher from Jamaica, right. a chemistry teacher from Jamaica, a <laughs> bachelor from Jamaica. So, so you, can, you can access this. And then more importantly, I think we can immediately begin as people to offer services. Now, from what I understand, and this statistic blew my mind, 80% of the graduates of tertiary institutions, I think generally, but I, I'm pretty sure about the University of West Indies, are, are in the market for leaving Jamaica right. to seek work after graduation. So there's a huge opportunity to, to have some of this group stay home, but have more people who don't have the opportunity to go overseas to sell their services globally. Right. So grab that one, I think. Yeah. Uh, how, how was COVID? I don't, nobody, I, I guess, certainly except um, maybe the epidemiologists understood fully, I think, at the start of this COVID crisis, how COVID would have affected the economy globally. How has that shifted the way you have led the, the businesses that you're a part of? The last thing that you want to do is be a manager in a business in which there's some suspicion that somebody has COVID mm -hmm. and you're seen to be or perceived to be hiding it from the team, Sure. for example. And so what it's doing is it's calling out real leaders. And I think that's, that's powerful. Uh, Shifting a little bit, uh, uh, a number of persons who are, are watching are um, young business owners, they are middle managers, they are CMOs, they are in many cases at the start or um, very early stage in their careers. How important has uh, mentorship been for you uh, uh, and in, in, in your, from everything that you do now and where the seat that you occupy? Um, how, how important? Um, as mentorship and a kind of developmental trajectory um, been, been in your life? I would say mentorship is important. Um, but in my particular case, all, you know, almost as important as being mentored yeah. is a, a bit of luck. And in my particular case, the luck of having peers at every stage of my life, who themselves were competitive, were provocative, were thoughtful, 
and you know I've actually learned a lot and 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 been motivated by the friends that I've had around me you know at each stage of the game and I, and I would encourage people not to discount that sure. not just to kind of look for the the big guy in the corner office but you know when you wake up in a relatively small society and I, I've been lucky because I I've had friends from other countries as well uh, about which I'm speaking but even in Jamaica you know and you've had a two decade or three decade relationship with people that you find compelling and interesting and provocative you know that can challenge your your frame of reference and be extraordinarily powerful so I encourage people to to do that too right. your, 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 your father is a uh corporate juggernaut in, in Jamaica. The juggernaut. Yes. I'll tell him you said that. <laughs> My terminology. Um, and the, the, did you feel pressure to go into business? Did you feel like this is something you had to do? Or was, did you want to be a jazz pianist at one point in time or a painter? I do not now wish to be a jazz pianist or a painter, <laughs> and I never did. And thankfully, I, you know, I don't have a competence to do that. So there's no struggle for me, but no, you know, I didn't have to resist the allure, or the push to get into business. Um, I, I would say the relationship with my father has been constructive and positive. You know, one of the things that I would say about that is that what I would say from my father I've gotten is that you can be successful in business in Jamaica based on what I've observed through him, and still be a person of principle and integrity and humility. So there is a pathway to do that. So in case you feel crowded out by role models that are getting success in a different methodology, then the one thing you know for sure that I've observed is that it's possible to do otherwise. Uh, the one of my one of the, the persons who I one enjoy reading his viewpoints on business and life is um, John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods. And one of the one of his, his probably his most famous work is around conscious capitalism and the need for, for capital um, as opposed to what happens in government or the civil service or anything else. Um, to be used as a way of transforming our society in a positive way. Um, you also, uh, the, is, is that something, maybe, maybe not the same words, but what is the role for, for, for deployment of capital in ensuring um, the, the overall transformation of a society like Jamaica? What's the role for the business sector in impacting the overall well-being of Jamaicans and Jamaica? So I think there are a lot of ways in which what you call conscious capitalism can be deployed, but the one that I find personally most interesting um, is creating just opportunities, just opening doors for people. You know, despite the kind of impression that we all put forward that success is a straight meritocracy in Jamaica, and certainly we wish it were so. But the truth is there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity in this country that is, is allocated um, based on some amount of privilege. Yeah. And so we really, in order to be the best that we can be as a country, we've got to, to make an effort to bring a, f a wide range of people to the table and give them a chance to show what they're made of. And to me, institutionally, that's hugely important. And we should be doing that all day long, every day, you know. And it's it's a gap in in parts of our education system, and it's a gap in parts of our corporate and commercial life. So that's that's where I see a role for myself, which is in mentoring, in um, just inclusion, and to some extent in nudging some parts of the education system to create opportunity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jeffrey O'Hall. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Digital Housing 2020. Uh, as always, there's plenty that we can go into and, and discuss further, uh, but um, hopefully we'll have you another time to, to have a further discussion. But I think 
um, your, your viewpoint and your outlook on the economy would have been invaluable to our audience. Thank you so much for being a part of Digital Housing 2020. Yeah. Good luck all and take over the world. <laughs> all right.